Well, thank you very much. And can I start by uh, thanking Joe and all of the team here at the McGill School for inviting me back. I kind of every time I come, I assume that it's uh, the last time I'm going to be here. But he keeps asking me. Maybe Joe has uh, similar views to mine in relation maybe to the electoral system that I'm going to talk a little bit about. Um, and maybe he hopes that uh, at some stage somebody will listen to me or him on, on that particular topic. But um, we, we have come through as a people a, a horrendous period in our history. There's no question about that. And there's no question that the crisis and the suffering was caused, as far as I'm concerned, and I was part of it, by the failure of governance. Um, and for that, the political system has to take the blame. Um, Teddy Roosevelt had the little plaque on his desk which stated, the book stops here. Um, and while all the faults and all the failings may not be the political system, the politicians are in charge and therefore they have to take the blame and the responsibility. And one would think that after all the pain and suffering that the crisis caused and continues to cause to many people, that those in charge, the politicians again, would reform the system to avoid a repetition of the disaster sometime in the future. And sadly, I have to say, apart from a lot of rhetoric about a democratic revolution and promises of reform made in election literature in 2011, there really has been little change and there's little sign of change. Uh, for that reason, I believe that we're destined to repeat the mistakes of the past sometime again in the future. It may not be the immediate future, but it will happen again. I suppose one of the ironies looking back on this is that that period from September 2008 to January 20, uh, 2014, it, it represents in a strange way probably uh, how well our system could work if our electoral system and our electoral cycle didn't get in the way. In that particular horrendous period, as I've described it, the political system actually worked more or less as it should in broad terms. Decisions during that time were made in the national interest. Vested interests who were pursuing their own agendas were ignored and decisions made. Long overdue reforms were put in place, some of them quite simple and should have been in place years previously. And we certainly ended up by getting more for less from our public services generally. At the initial part of that, talking about the Fianna Fáil end of that from 2008 to 2010, the opposition did what the opposition does in the current electoral system that we have, and that is criticised and attacked the incumbent government. They didn't attack all of the decisions, but many of them they did. They came to power, promises of burning bondholders and uh, having it Labour's way rather than Frankfurt's way or whatever. And as soon as they got into government, they changed tack because they too accepted the fact that they had to abandon the rhetoric and operate in the real world and in the national interest by giving effect to the four-year plan that they had previously derided. The reason they do that is, despite perhaps a lot of the negativity in media generally about politicians, is they are almost, to a man or a woman, committed to doing the right thing I still think, though, that they allow the electoral system and the electoral cycle get in the way of doing that too often. Um, in fairness to the government, uh, the present government as well, it has to be acknowledged that in sticking to the general plan, they also sought to improve it, to get significant concessions, and they achieved that uh, for the country and for the people of the country. 
I suppose as a result of politicians doing their job and making decisions in the national interest during that particular time, we're now in a much better place than we would have been had the politicians decided that it was, they were going to continue with business as usual. The sad thing about it all, though, is that it took such a monumental crisis to bring that about. And it's even sadder that as soon as there were signs of the crisis receding and elections looming, that politicians seem to be reverting to form. And I give as one example of this, and I'm not making party political points, but the Irish water debacle is a prime example of a government that took its eye off the national interest ball, if you like, and back onto the short-termism that we've seen so long in Irish politics. And I think it illustrates clearly why our political system has continually failed us over the years. I'm not, I'm not saying that the political system has been totally bad all of the time, but a lot of the decisions that were made based on short-termism have uh, undermined our system. The system, we seem to never anticipate the next crisis that we're going to have because the main focus uh, of our political leaders is always on short-termism. We live in the moment to a very dangerous extent. We love the, the here and now rather than the longer term. We focus on, on tactics to cope with the immediate rather than the strategic planning to anticipate difficulties and potential crises that might arise in the future. And as a result of that, unfortunately, we're geared to the last crisis. Probably when the next crisis comes, we'll have our system geared up for property bubbles and bank um, crashes while we will we'll need to deal with um, terrorism or cyber terrorism or something else, always looking back and always a little bit too late. But as a, as a result of this short-termism, our political system is skewed to the local rather than the national. It's skewed towards individual problems rather than system failures that need to be changed. And by the way, that political system moves lockstep with the media on this particular aspect of it. It's much easier to sell a newspaper, and it's not that easy to sell newspapers nowadays, but it's much easier if the story is about an evil individual who has done, who, or who can be personally blamed for something that has gone wrong, rather than if the story is about a failure of the system. Our system, as we have it at the moment, means that our TDs spend an inordinate amount of time representing the needs of individuals rather than scrutinising the actions of government or their agencies or regulators who are appointed to oversee our systems, financial and otherwise. The tyranny of the current system reduces the time and opportunity the TDs has, have to study, to research, to think about broader issues, and it leaves them open to unduly relying on vested interests and lobby groups for their information and research. It's no wonder that people have lost trust and confidence in the current political system, which is not delivering what it should. And to restore that trust and confidence, we need to change, I believe, our electoral system to ensure that politicians do the job that they're elected to do <laughs> and that they're paid to do. We need to change the system to make, it, to make our TDs more effective, more representative, and more focused on the job. We can say our system is very representative, but we've just had to pass legislation to give quota, uh, gender quotas so that we can have half of our population more adequately represented in the, in the doll. The new system where you'd have list and elected TDs would remove or should remove the tyranny that we have of a system that is solely based on localism and clientelism.
The problem that I see is that TDs, uh, our senators, are the status quo, are not going to change that. Why would you change a system where you continually get elected? Why would you change a system where your party happens to be the major party over uh, a long period of time? In most countries where significant electoral reform took place, the main impetus and drive for it came from outside the party political system and mainly from citizens' movements and from very powerful and strong independent bodies. With our TDs focused on their real job, we could bridge that gap between, uh, that has arisen between the politicians and the people they represent because system failure would have to get more scrutiny uh, from our elected representatives. Instead of looking after the one constituent and competing with the other four TDs in the constituency to look after that one, you'd be looking at the system and finding out why it wasn't working for all our citizens. The system that I'd like to see in place would mean that at least half of the people elected would be chosen for their skills and their exp expertise. You'd have a much more effective committee system in the House if you had that better able to take on the experts in charge of the various services who simply forget at times that they are actually there to deliver for the people. A parliament made up uh, from an electoral system such as the one I'm talking about would ensure a balance between those that are enslaved, and I use the word advisedly, enslaved by a clientelist culture and those committed to pursuing broad, a broad strategic agenda for the betterment of all citizens. Those ele elected from a list would be freed from an endless round of meetings about various local issues to think and research uh, issues and concerns from a national standpoint, not a local one. The doll would benefit from having experts with knowledge expertise and experience to challenge the system and its failing. Our members of Parliament could therefore be freer to take on well-reasoned positions on government policies and activities. List elected deputies would be under less pressure electorally to adopt populist positions and thus bring a greater balance to debate and decisions. Everybody thinks, well I think most people think that our present system has failed us because parliamentary scrutiny was poor and parliament was powerless and government called all the shots. In the new scenario, parliament could reassert its independence from government and we can begin to see uh, their primary function as holding the government to account. And that's what they're there for. Asserting their independence and their primary role as representatives of, of the people rather than just as lobby father, uh, TDs would help, it would help to, uh, to reconnect the elected with their electors. Michael McDowell made one suggestion which I agree with. The first step in asserting that independence from government would be to elect their own Cown Corla, all deputies to do that. Equally, I agree with the proposition that committees and chairs should be selected by members on a proportionate basis by a powerful CPP, not just by government. Parliament is supposed to hold government to account. It should not be subservient to government. Apart from the committees shadowing ministers and their department, I think we need one more powerful independent parliamentary committee. We already have what's called the Fiscal Advisory Council. It's established and, uh, uh, at, at present. It needs to be reconstituted as an instrument of Parliament, not a body nominated by government. Its terms of ref reference need to be broadened to give Parliament access to the very best independent fiscal advice to enable it to scrutinise what government is doing and to ensure that they're re remaining within the parameters that they should. It should be based on a Canadian model 
where their public budget office is appointed and financed by Parliament and is answerable to Parliament, not to the government. It should have the same powers and resources that the Dutch equivalent, the CPB, has, which enables it to vet the manifestos of political parties pre an election to ensure their policies are fiscally responsible. Um, a political party in the Netherlands will not breach uh, guidelines in their expenditure, in their, in their manifestos, because this body will point it out to the electorate. After that, the electorate um, can make up their own mind about it. That committee should have the same independence and constitutional protection as the controller and auditor general or the omb ombudsman. If we had that kind of a committee, I doubt if its advice would be ignored as the advice of the current um, uh, uh, Fiscal Advisory Council has been ignored. Um, I'm not casting any aspersions on their independence. They've shown their independence, the, the members. But the chair of that body recently said uh, of the government's plan, the plan, uh, quoting directly, the plan as set out for 2016 does not fully comply with the rules. These are the rules that were referred to earlier on uh, in, in, the, in the earlier discussion. And as we look beyond that, there isn't a proper plan in place at all. There are real questions about the credibility of projections for government spending. Without a strong budgetary framework, we do risk a return to the kind of policies that led to mistakes that certainly contributed to the crisis. That's what the Fiscal Advisory Council has said about the government's plans in relation to uh, the period post-2016. Just pause the question, have we learned anything at all? It looks like we haven't. One other area I just want to touch on is uh, the whole area of, of citizens. If they feel that uh, they don't know what's going on in the system, um, it leads to a lack of confidence and trust. Ensuring more information is, a, is more readily available to the public would help, I believe, to rebuild that trust among the public. We could start with our PQ, our Parliamentary Question System, which is seriously outdated and ineffective. We need a system where the presumption is that all the information on the file should be released once a question is asked. It beggars belief to me, and I listened to it for 20 years in, in Dáil Éireann, uh, that nearly a quarter of a century after the quote, you didn't ask the right question uh, in relation to beef exports, that was the defence used by a Fianna Fáil minister at that time, that that defence was used more recently, most recently, a few months back, when questions were being raised about the site serve scandal. So our questions, our PQ system, is certainly in need of reform. We need it to hold ministers to account, not, time, not waste time with local inquiries, like when Mrs. O'Brien is going to get her medical guard. It's hardly a national question. It's an important one to Mrs. O'Brien, but it could be dealt with much more easily. You have to, we must have a real question system where once a program for government is agreed, each minister presents his program to the relevant complete committee complete with detailed key performance indicators and goals and then he should be called in to account for that on a regular basis. Because of the distrust of politicians currently, there's a belief that there's insiders with all the knowledge and information and a whole series of cosy cartels in operation. In order to show that that isn't the case, I believe that ministerial and top-level civil servants appoint, uh, appointments, diary appointments, should be published on a weekly basis post facto. Similarly, all correspondence to ministers and top civil servants, which is non-personal, should be listed and made public on a weekly basis. That list made public on a weekly basis. Those types of changes might convince those who feel alienated from the system that there's no great conspiracy there. And it might also pull out the rug from under those who try to ferment the belief um, 
this particular belief for their own political agenda. Those simple reforms would save money. They won't cost anything. There's no legislation that needs to be changed to do any of them. Finally, the question posed for this session, session is, are our public services contaminated by the political environment in which they must operate and their commitment and innovation limited by it? Yes, is the answer. Uh, it's inevitable, it's unavoidable with our current system, our current electoral system, that our public services and our public servants are contaminated with the localism of our political system generally. Generally, thousands of hours of civil servants' time is taken up answering PQs on local issues. Each minister has a dedicated constituency office st with staff to pursue local constituency queries. So has each TD. Tens of thousands of letters are sent to public service bodies each year raising local issues. Thousands of weeks of civil servants' time is used each year answering these letters and answering telephone calls. With so much resources and time used up on these kind of queries, it's impossible to concentrate on the larger picture to ensure that our systems are working well with our, uh, for all our citizens. It also means that all the advice and recommendations made to ministers will be tempered by the political reality of the local constituency. It is a system that is very, very unfair to our public service. A solution, I believe, and it's a much broader issue, a solution to a lot of it, though, is to devolve more power locally to, more, to a more accountable local government system. Get rid of the overly centralised system of government we have. Peel away the layers and layers and layers of bureaucracy trying to deal with local matters at a national level and let them be decided locally. The concentration on local when we have so many problems nationally is not good for the future of this country. We've seen the damage it's done. That damage will be repeated. Our parliament needs to recover its place at the centre of a national discussion on the medium to long-term future of this country in an open and a non-partisan way. We had a brief discussion this morning about uh, the makeup of the next doll, and I can see some merit in what looks to be uh, the, the situation or what looks to, like the current situ situation will be post the next election where the composition of the doll will be more fragmented and diverse. I think it will result in a situation where there will have to be an awful lot more engagement and discussion and agreement on issues of national importance. It may mean that decisions will take longer, but I think we may be better for all of that. And it may mean that our system will move to a more continental model where government has to listen to parliament and its views before deciding the major issues at national or EU level. Who knows, it may even mean that we'll have a real discussion on our electoral system, and we might even change it. Thank you.